Good afternoon and welcome to the Lowy Institute for the 2022 Owen Harries Lecture. I'm Hervé Lamayeu, the Director of Research here at the Institute, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Euro Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Since 2013, the annual Owen Harries Lecture has honored the significant contribution made to the international debate in Australia and the United States by Owen Harries, who was a non-resident fellow at the, Lowy, at the Lowy Institute. Owen Harries passed away in June 2020 at the age of 90 years old. He was one of the giants of the foreign policy world, and in Australia he was an academic and a trusted prime ministerial advisor. He also spent nearly two decades on the international stage, first in Paris as, the, as Australia's ambassador to UNESCO, and then, of course, in Washington, D.C. as the founding editor of The National Interest. He provided counsel and advice to countless young scholars of international affairs, and I'm glad that we have a few among them here in the audience today. And he always encouraged us to think big and address the most pressing issues at the heart of the international system. His intellect and wit illuminated the world and Australia's place in it. The Harry's Lecture has now been given by many important figures, including American diplomat Kurt Campbell, Ambassador Shyam Saran, the former head of the Indian Foreign Minister, Ministry, Jean-David Levitte, a French diplomat and advisor to three French presidents, Jake Sullivan, who is now the National Security Advisor to President Joe Biden, and of course, the renowned political theorist, Professor Francis Fukuyama. This year, for the first time since the pandemic, we're able to host a lecture in person. And it's a great pleasure and a distinct honor to have one of the world's most distinguished military strategists, Sir Lawrence Friedman, join us here in person in Sydney to deliver the Owen Harris Lecture. Sir Lawrence is Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London. He has held positions at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Chatham House, and was appointed Professor of War Studies at King's College in 1982 in a department founded by his mentor and friend, the great Sir Michael Howard. He was the first head of King's School of Social Science and Public Policy and served as the vice principal of the college until 2013. As a historian and analyst, Sir Lawrence wrote the British government's official history of the Falklands War. And he's written extensively, 61 books by my count, but you, you might be able to correct me there. <laughs> on nuclear deterrence, military operations, the history of military strategy, and the future of war. In 2003, he was made a Knight Commander of St. Michael and St. George, KCMG, and later that decade, he was asked to serve as a member of the official inquiry into Britain's role in the 2003 Iraq War. Since Russia's brutal and unjustified invasion earlier this year in February, his commentary on the war has been read and reread around the world, including in Australia. I'm delighted, therefore, now to ask Sir Lawrence Friedman to deliver the 2022 Owen Harry's lecture titled Inhumane War. Sir Lawrence, the lectern is yours. Thanks very much. It's, it's a real honor to be, a uh, pleasure to be back at the Lowy Institute. Uh, the Lowy brought me to Australia for the first time a couple of decades ago. Uh, and particularly honoured, uh, this is an honour of uh, Owen Harris, who, uh, like many of you here, I knew, uh, a man of uh, sharp wit, uh, sceptical, serious, uh, but somebody who was always encouraging, always enjoyed a good conversation and a good argument. Uh, so it, it really is a, a, a pleasure to be able to give this lecture in his honour. A few years ago, Samuel Moyne published a book entitled Humane War, uh, which is all about the temptations to wage war um, if you thought it was, so to speak, relatively harmless. Uh, this would be the case if you need only uh, target those who deserve targeting while sparing everybody else. But best of all, of course, in this model is that you could stay out of harm's way yourself. And the idea of this sort of humane war came from observing the role that weaponized drones uh, had played in the later stages of the war on terror when President Obama found himself agreeing to assassinations of individuals in a variety 
of otherwise inaccessible parts of the world uh, who were believed to be responsible for terrorist atrocities or were actively planning them. And this was linked, and Moyne linked it to a historic debate, um, which is essentially if war, um, if wars uh, uh, are going to occur, shouldn't we make every effort to mitigate uh, their effects? But if we mitigate them too much, doesn't that make wars even more attractive as an instrument of policy? Uh, doesn't it not legitimize uh, what we should really be trying to avoid uh, as a way of settling disputes? Now, the difficulty with Moyne's case was that uh, the use of drones for targeted assassinations was really rather a special case. Most wars are about territory, whether uh, defending it or seizing it, um, and they're unlikely to revolve around the fate of, of a few individuals. And the moment we're witnessing in Europe uh, something that is far from a humane war. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's, it's, its inhumanity is palpable. It's seen a quarter of the Ukrainian population displaced, um, with over six million having left the country. A number of cities have become famous for the destruction that they faced, Mariupol, Kharkiv, Donetsk, uh, along with many towns and villages. They've been battered by Russian firepower. In places occupied by Russian forces, there have been numerous reported instances of torture, incarceration and murder of individuals alleged to be working against Russian forces, as well as looting, sexual abuse and wanton violence and destruction in areas which Russia uh, has claimed uh, uh, for itself. Uh, and in some of these areas have been enforced changes, including to education, currency, uh, replacing of the Ukrainian with the Russian language, and so on. Um, this is not just inhumane in the ways that all wars tend to inhumanity, lives wasted uh, and far too many left mourning. The inhumanity is part of the strategy, at least on the Russian side. Putin, of course, is not the first to try to win a war by making life miserable for whole populations uh, as a way of coercing the, their government. Uh, but the brazen nature of this attempt is quite startling. And so far, it hasn't succeeded. And I don't think it will. Um, but if that is the case, then we need to understand why. So to explore this issue in this lecture, what I want to do is to consider two contrasting models of war fighting associated with the United States and with the Russian Federation, um, describing how much they diverge, particularly when it comes to the deliberate targeting of civil society. This leads into a discussion of the Russo-Ukraine war. Um, this has been the closest we've had for some time uh, in its intensity and the types of forces involved uh, to a war between major powers. Unlike Russia, of course, Ukraine didn't enter this war with the attributes of a great power. It's not a permanent member of the Security Council. It doesn't have a nuclear arsenal. It gave up the arsenal it had inherited uh, from the Soviet Union, uh, it, it, famously with the Budapest Memorandum, which gave it security assurances, not quite guarantees, uh, in 1994, which turned out not to be very useful. Um, it doesn't, unlike Russia, deploy its armed forces beyond its borders in support of clients and allies. It was, however, is, however, fighting a war with uh, NATO support uh, and increasingly NATO weaponry. Until this war, there had been remarkably little to go on uh, with regard to a conventional war between the regular forces of major powers, uh, or peer competitors, as the Pentagon calls them. During the 21st century, Western armies uh, defeated much weaker opponents in the conventional stages of their wars, although they then got bogged down in insurgencies. Russia also fought against weaker opponents in Chechnya, with one more starting in 1994 and another in 1999, Georgia in 2008, Crimea, Eastern Ukraine in 2014, and then in support of the Syrian government from 2015. The most recent example 
prior to this war of a conventional conflict with relatively modern uh, equipment was the short uh, Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict of September 2020. It was evident there that drones were making a difference to contemporary tactics just as the 1991 Gulf War confirmed what had been seen uh, in 1972 in Vietnam, the precision-guided munitions were creating new options for conducting a war that allowed uh, for accurate targeting of enemy systems and avoidance of centers of population. This led to hopes that war could become more humane, at least in staying close to the laws of armed conflict. It reflects a classical view that the objective of military action is to eliminate the military capabilities of the enemy, ensuring that fighting is largely confirmed to competence so that non-combatants are spared. In this case, it's assumed that military defeat leads di directly to political defeat, or at least the quality of the eventual political settlement will reflect the uh, uh, extent of the military vic uh, victory. Now, accepting that we're simplifying here somewhat, there's another contrasting type of war. Um, this is a continuation of all the trends towards total war uh, that led uh, to the persecution of populations as well as the deliberate um, attacks on them from massive air raids uh, of the Second World War and then eventually the introduction of nuclear weapons. In this type, the enemy's civil society and economy are legitimate targets because they are responsible for funding and manufacturing the equipment vital to the conduct of military operations, because also um, if they're constantly hit and, uh, and damaged, that might remove and undermine the enemy's will and capacity to fight, and because um, the subjugation and even extermination uh, of populations is one potentially of the of the war aims. Describing these as ideal types, uh, social scientists amongst you will, will recognize the Max Weber reference here. Uh, ideal type is not a um, idealized form of warfare. It's rather, um, it's not so much a description, it's just, it is a simplification, a construct that picks up the essential characteristics of a particular phenomenon uh, to help show it in its purest form in order to facilitate analysis and also to guide action. Uh, though these ideal types may shape strategy, uh, actual practice will differ because of the nature of the adversary strategy, the operational conditions, and the wider political context. Keeping that in mind, let's consider first the ideal type of conventional strategy most associated with Western militaries. Um, and in this, in this idealized form, war is conducted separately from civil society, with the belligerents gaining advantage through the speed of their decision-making, the quality of their technology, and the professionalism of their tactics. Those working within this framework have been particularly enamored uh, with operational concepts based on outmaneuvering the enemy in battle, avoiding attritional warfare, which is just based on trading firepower, and so tending towards um, a true ideal in a way in which all casualties, military as well as civilian, can be reduced. This form came into fashion after the 1991 uh, Gulf War under the banner of the revolution in military affairs. Western countries concentrated on developing technologies that fitted this ideal type, integrating sensors, command networks, and guidance systems that could achieve pinpoint accuracy at extended ranges. And in the way it was often presented, um, this could, in the way, be considered a, a more humane way to fight wars. Now, there are well-known problems with this type. First, it encourages a view of warfare as the preserve of military professionals and conducted by armed forces with regard for each other, but not the political context within which they're operating. In practice, the boundaries between the military and civilian spheres are less clear-cut. Even in the 1991 war, and certainly in those fought since, it's become apparent that military operations 
including those conducted uh, with the most accurate weapons, could not avoid civilian relevant targets, especially those connected to the infrastructure supporting the enemy's military operations, notably transport, transportation links, but also energy and administration. Um, the attacks on power supplies didn't start with this war. Second, although integral to this ideal type is the core principle that every effort should be made to avoid deliberate attacks on civilians, civilian casualties still happen. This was certainly true when dealing with insurgencies. Enemy militants were often indistinguishable from civilians, and efforts to avoid killing innocents often fail. This is one of the difficulties with the drone warfare. Enemy militants um, uh, uh, merged into, into the villages uh, as a way of protecting themselves, uh, and it was very difficult to work out uh, who it was that you were confronting uh, when uh, soldiers were on patrol. And for this reason, it was difficult to get the, the, the troops to, uh, to show the necessary restraint that counterinsurgency warfare was often assumed to require. It required that considerations of force protection take precedence over um, avoiding civ uh, civilian casualties. Uh, that is, the more uh, do you take risks with civilian lives or with your own forces. And the senior commanders might have one view, but frankly, if you were the one on patrol, you might take a different view. The effort to reduce humanitarian costs through a sharp focus on defeating enemy combatants created narrative issues when, with any non-combatant deaths because of the implication that this was the result um, of problems with decision-making, technology, or tactics, and not just the inherent uncertainties of wars fought amongst the people. Third, it required that the losing side accept the judgment of battle uh, and not escalate uh, to uh, a, a potentially more um, uh, intensive form of warfare uh, or, or more population-centric form of warfare uh, in which it might believe that it had a better chance of prevailing. So these were the, um, the you were clear, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue there's, a, there's, a, there's a, uh, an excellent Western model and a terrible Russian model. There are problems with both models of war. But the intent um, with, with the Western model, uh, the starting point is that you should do your best to avoid uh, civilian casualties. So with the second model, what appeared to be the result of carelessness and uncertainty appeared desirable. Uh, the direct targeting of civil society uh, happens to be less demanding in many ways than confining your military operations to the enemy military. Um, it requires uh, directing whatever firepower you've got, artillery, rockets, missiles, aircraft, at large targets without any particular requirement for precision. Although precision can enable attacks on particularly significant targets, such as refineries, power stations, railway hubs, government buildings, hospitals, and schools. Even before Ukraine, the Russians appeared to have embraced this ideal type, this model. In the wars against Chechnya to prevent secession, the tactics were often quite brutal, and the capital Grozny was left flattened. Uh, in operations to support the Syrian government against rebels from 2015, Russia not only provided cover to prevent uh, criticism of the Syrians for their use of chemical weapons and barrel bombs, but also used air power to make life as difficult as possible for civilians to encourage them to leave. Uh, so this was the other side of the coin to precision guidance. The same systems that can be used to avoid hitting civilians could also be used to target them effectively. In Aleppo, for example, Russian aircraft deliberately struck hospitals, often using coordinates handed to them through the United Nations in order to help them avoid those buildings. This Russian ideal type is highly political. It's, ins it's insensitive 
uh, to civilian, or actually for that matter, military casualties, and ruthless in its determination to defeat its opponent. Tellingly, it works hard on the narrative surrounding any military operations, seeking to demonstrate that the victims deserved all they got and that Russia was only acting according to severe provocations. Putin is widely blamed for a false flag operation in September 1999 involving apparent terrorist attacks against residential accommodation in Russia to provide a pretext for the Second Chechen War, which he launched immediately after those attacks and which helped him manage the transition from being prime minister to becoming president. With Ukraine in 2014, he was looking for demonstrations of spontaneous support for action against the government in Kyiv, which he rec received with regard to Crimea, but was equivocal in the Donbass. With Syria, there was less need because he could claim to be acting in support of an established government. Although this was presented as an anti-ISIS operation, Russia adopted a pretty expansive definition of ISIS, really to include any anti-Assad group, uh, as they were all effectively supporting, as far as he was concerned, the Islamists. Now, the obvious problem with this type of warfare is that it is inhumane. It essentially depends on committing war crimes. Uh, the second problem is its questionable strategic utility. If there is a strategic purpose to attacking civil society, it's to influence enemy decision, make, enemy decision makers uh, to look for ways out of the war to relieve the pain and punishment. As with any coercive effort, it cannot dictate um, the, the target's reaction. Compliance is one possibility, but angry resistance is another. There are instances when it could be said to have worked, for example, in persuading rebel supporters to flee Aleppo. And if you actually look at the way it's strategically employed, you will see quite a lot of suggestions, even in Ukraine, that one of the ideas is to encourage uh, another refugee crisis in Europe. But to work as a standalone strategy, uh, inhumane warfare requires that the victim population is unable to adapt to the terror and hardship of their situation, and also that there are political processes uh, that can turn their misery into a demand for change in the government strategy. It's not enough that the people are miserable. They must act on their misery. Uh, given that it is not the government that is making their life miserably, not their own government, um, other than by refusing to capitulate, then it's likely, and in fact quite usual, that the greatest anger will be directed uh, at the perpetrators of the crimes. So such strategies tend to be used for want of any alternative way of hurting the enemy, um, or else as a supplement to, to uh, more regular military strategies of the, of the first type that I was describing. Uh, in fact, because of the limits of this sort of strategy uh, as a form of coercion, uh, it may well, as happened with Ukraine, still require uh, land operations to take control of disputed territory or even to seize control of the enemy's decision-making center. This then creates questions about the interaction between the two efforts. At its simplest, should firepower be directed against targets that would degrade civilian life or support land operations, the choice the Russians have faced. And they've chosen the former, by and large. Russia, under Putin, has shown a coercive mindset, particularly when using energy and economic measures to encourage other states to be compliant with Russian wishes. This was, after all, how the Ukrainian crisis began in 2013, when Putin turned the screws on the pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, to dissuade him from signing an association agreement with the EU. This was successful, except that the popular reaction against this uh, decision set in motion the Euro Maiden movement and all that followed. In Chechnya and Georgia, he used military pressure to force political settlements. In Syria, Russia acted ruthlessly to encourage, his, to encourage those in rebel areas to flee, though it did not contribute troops to this effort. Putin's approach, including in Ukraine 
in 2014 combined ruthlessness with keeping liabilities limited. So while attacks on Grozny or Aleppo might have foreshadowed the attacks on Mariupol and Kharkiv earlier this year, they were not the full tests of a coercive military strategy. The Western model sought to limit the humanitarian costs of military operations, but was subverted by interactions with civil society. Descriptions of future conflict that show opposing forces interacting well away from populated areas will always be unrealistic. This was even more so with the so-called wars amongst the people that began after the end of the Cold War, when regular forces faced hostility from at least some sections of the population. Western campaigns, therefore, have become associated with humanitarian distress, despite the accuracy of the weaponry and the skill with which it was used. But because they were occupying territory where their presence was resisted, or else they had taken sides in an internal conflict. The Russian model was apparently indifferent to humanitarian costs and had no issues with taking sides, but Putin had sought to limit his liabilities. The Syrian civil war was the deadliest that the region has known, but Russia confined itself to air power, so it was not caught up in any heavy fighting. In Ukraine in 2014, the annexation of Crimea involved a little for actual fighting, some but not much. The situation was different in the Donbass, where Russian-sponsored separatist groups, often led by Russians, uh, tried to foment rebellion against the government, the new government in Kiev. And only later on in that, when they were in trouble, did the Russians intervene directly. But again, Putin then tried to limit his liabilities, and you had the, Mil the Minsk process to try to produce some sort of political settlement. So when uh, there were in talks of future war, um, the US presented the future uh, as one of these peer competitors fighting conventional battles away from centers of population. This in some ways reflected an aspiration to escape from the grinding civil conflicts that accounted for most of the ongoing 21st century wars. And as I've tried to indicate, was always optimistic. There's just limits on how much civilians can be protected from wars being fought in the areas in which they're living. But this doesn't mean to say that there is no difference between the two ideal types I'm describing. They diverge most of all on the question of whether civilians would be deliberately targeted in war. The Western model, at least in line with the Geneva Conventions, was that civilians should be protected as much as possible. The Russian model agreed in principle, um, but in practice was far more ruthless. It might not matter to those attacked if they were victims of unfortunate collateral damage or deliberate coercion, but the strategic use of firepower to intimidate populations and clear residential areas of hostile populations uh, will inevitably cause the greatest humanitarian distress. One reason why this year's war has provoked such a striking contrast um, in the military strategies is actually not so much the influence of NATO thinking on Ukrainian practice, but actually Ukraine has obviously every incentive to reduce the harm to their own civilian population. It's not fighting on Russian soil. While Russia was inclined to target civilians not only as a preferred military strategy, but also because of its underlying political objectives. Now, as a, as a conventional war, uh, this conflict has demonstrated the importance of such factors as logistics and chains of command in determining military effect, effectiveness, as well as terrain, rivers um, have affected both offensive and defensive operations. Because of Russia's nuclear status, that dimension has always been present, limiting what NATO countries were prepared to do uh, when it came to direct support for Ukraine, but also what Russians might try against the NATO countries supporting Ukraine. In a way, it sharpened the contrast in strategies because even if it had wanted to retaliate in kind against Russia, which it was never going to be able to do on any scale, Ukraine could barely do so at all. It's been 
bits at border areas, but nothing very much. So it had to concentrate its firepower on targets relevant to the Russian military effort, ammunition dumps, logistic hubs, command posts, bases, and so on. This focus, along with the high motivation of its troops, has been one of the keys to its success in its counteroffensive. In terms of causing harm to Ukraine, um, from the Russian side, the, the, they can claim a tragic success. Infrastructure has been destroyed and the economy set back. Some 40% of GDP possibly lost this year. Uh, tens of thousands of civilians have been killed and wounded. Millions have been displaced. Military casualties also extremely high. Yet the Russian effort to eliminate Ukraine as a sovereign nation with a strong identity has backfired completely. The attacks on civilian life brought Russia no military advantages. Cities and towns were defended despite the rubble. Any claims that the territory of the Donbass was being liberated became absurd when it was precisely the most Russian parts of the country that were harmed the most. Even if, as many supposed, the Russian objective was to seize and incorporate this territory into a greater Russia, which is what um, Putin has now announced with the annexation of the four provinces. But this prize will come to it devastated and depopulated if it came to it at all. With those left, certainly not those who had not been living in the separatist enclaves full of hatred for Russia. If the effort had been coercive in intent, it failed. Russian brutality did not prompt calls for capitulation, but reinforced the determination to fight on. Evidence from opinion polls demonstrated a nation no longer divided by regions or language, but convinced that victory against the occupiers was both possible and above all necessary. Whether or not this was realistic, we'll have to see. But it created an asymmetry of motivation that told in Ukraine's favor. On the Russian side, there was and is evidence of extremely poor morale. And while the bad behavior may have reflected incessant anti-Ukrainian propaganda, it also reflected poor discipline as valuable space on military vehicles was taken up with looted goods. The effort was also counterproductive in that it convinced Western countries that they couldn't let Russia win and so had to provide Ukraine not only with weapons to defend against Russian offensives, um, but the heavier weapons needed for counterattacks to stop pushing Russian forces out of occupied territory. As Russian forces left territory near to Kiev uh, uh, in last March, we saw then uh, what terrible, the terrible revelations about the war crimes, uh, how that hardened uh, Western opinion and led to, to, to pressure uh, to supply more and better weapons. It removed incentives for Kiev to negotiate. Now, it's too early to pronounce the, the Russian strategy of failure because the war isn't over yet. Um, it, you can point out that it's in, implemented um, the inhumane aspect of its water, of its um, of its warfare, uh, quite efficiently. It got more efficient uh, with the recent attacks on the electricity grid. Um, even this is so. Even while its uh, uh, classical land operations have been poorly executed, uh, and uh, the use of the newly mobilised forces. Uh, who were described as cannon fodder uh, when they were mobilized, turns out rather sadly to be wholly justified. So, and also I don't want to set up a false dichotomy. Um, all war is to a degree inhumane. Um, the issue is not one of methodology, but purpose. What in the end shaped Russian strategy was not solely a belief in the power of coercion, but a contempt for Ukraine uh, and a denial of their humanity. In that sense, the war method followed from the war aim. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Lawrence. Laurie, thank you for a, a very stimulating uh, lecture. Uh, good to be reminded about Weberian uh, ideal types. I haven't come across that uh, in a while, but it's 
uh, offers a, um, a way of thinking through the concepts. And, and I thought it was incredibly interesting, you know, the intent versus the execution, the distinction to be drawn there as well. So thank you for agreeing to take some questions for me and, and the audience a little later. You argue that inhumanity is, is not just a feature of this war, it's not just palpable, but it's part of the strategy. It's highly political, it's desired uh, by the Russians. And yet, surely, years from now or even today, when Russians look back at their ideal type for how to conduct a successful invasion, Ukraine can't qualify, um, can't possibly qualify. As you say, attacks on human life had, had no real military advantage. So were you surprised by Russia's military failures? I mean, on the basis of everything you knew about their doctrine, their strategy, their capabilities. And then to what extent did you think, or do you think the current situation is a result of deficiencies or, or Russian incompetence, um, or in fact, Ukrainian skill? On the latter point, it's, com it's both. I mean, the, the Ukrainians, uh, uh, First, I think I, I used first with the Iran-Iraq war of the delicate balance of incompetence. So all armies are incompetent, um, and it's just in, in their nature of what they're trying to do. And no, there was a lot of, of incompetence on the Ukrainian side, especially early on, but they were less incompetent uh, than the Russians, uh, and learned and adapted uh, and allowed uh, individual units that take initiatives in a way that's not part of the, uh, uh, of the Russian system. Um, I wasn't surprised in, in the sense that I never thought that, the, that a, a campaign of conquest against Ukraine could succeed. I, I mean, like others, I was skeptical, not because the Russians were you know, they clearly were up to something, so you, you couldn't just dismiss all these forces gathered around the border, but you know, what did they think they were doing? Well, how could they possibly believe that they could subjugate a country you know, the size of France, um, popular, similar, you know, a bit smaller population, but 44 million people? How did they think they could do this? Uh, and they couldn't, and, and it was clear that they wouldn't be able to. Um, but there was a, I mean, the, the, so the surprises were the things you thought they would do well, use air power, possibly cyber attacks, um, combined arms operations, they didn't do well. Uh, they, the um, air power is, is still one of the mysteries of the whole Russian effort. Uh, and that partly reflects a lack of preparation, but it also reflects, the point I was trying to make, an underlying contempt for Ukraine, an arrogance, uh, a belief that this isn't a proper country, um, it doesn't have a legitimate government, uh, it's inherently divided, the people wouldn't fight. Um, and that's, in the end, uh, I think, what, what, uh, uh, what caused the failure. Hmm. Now, as it's become apparent that Mr. Putin's special military operation uh, was not going to plan, he's repeatedly and increasingly of late raised the spectre of using nuclear weapons. Do you think, as an expert on nuclear strategy, that that is a red herring or something to, uh, to take into serious account? Well, you know, you've always got to take into serious account the possibility of nuclear war. Doesn't tiny chance is enough to make people quite frightened, uh, properly so. But the point is, nuclear weapons are being used. They've been used from day one. Nuclear weapons are used in the purpose for which they are particularly suited: deterrence. Uh, Putin has made it clear um, from his what he said on the twenty fourth of Feb. What he made a special announcement a few days later. There was a press conference a couple, three weeks ago where he said more or less the same thing. If NATO intervenes directly, um, then they risk a wider nuclear war. How much they do, I don't know, but NATO has not intervened directly. That's why there's no, no fly zones uh, that Zelensky wanted earlier on. So uh, in that sense, nuclear weapons have served Putin's purposes perfectly well up to now, which is why I would be surprised if he jeopardized that by trying to use them to turn the battle around, for which they're not particularly suited. Uh, you know, it's a very dispersed battlefield. Uh, you need 
to, to, for use a quote unquote tactical nuclear weapon. You need a very concentrated uh, force. Um, uh, and it's not like, I mean, they're not that concentrated, uh, because, partly because existing firepower makes them vulnerable. And we saw what happens with the Russian ammunition dumps, they're quite easily picked out. So I, um, I, I, my working assumption has been that they won't be used. Uh, you know, as with the, you know, from the start of this war, you've been trying to read one man's mind, um, and as he's done you know, one stupid thing, he can do another stupid thing, but it would be stupid. Uh, it, it's hard to see how it would fix the political and military problems he's created. Um, so you know, it's understandable that everybody pays attention to it. The Americans clearly take it very seriously, hence the news reports about um, uh, US national security advisor meeting his Russian equivalent, or talking to his Russian equivalent, which must have been an extraordinary conversation if you know his Russian equivalent. Um, uh, Patrushev is, is about, uh, makes Putin look a little moderate, I think. Um, but uh, anyway, so you understand, I mean, it, it, nuclear weapons are, are is serious stuff, but it is having an effect. And he doesn't need, as we have seen, to escalate. He can, he can do damage to civilian societies without having to uh, rely on nuclear weapons to do so. Mm. Yeah, as you say, there are other ways of escalation or of, of ramping up um, the, the war effort. Do you think that there is more in this arsenal of inhumanity uh, that Russia could yet deploy, or has it already been notched up to its maximum level? Short of nuclear weapons, I think it's quite difficult. Um, I mean, Ukrainian air defences are improving. They're not good enough yet because it doesn't need much to get through. Cheap Iranian drones uh, can be knocked down, but by extremely expensive systems. Mm. Um, so uh, I think th th they do have a problem. I mean, you can't gloss over the problem the Ukrainians are facing with this. Um, but as they're also making clear, even if they have to have blackouts, they'll carry on fighting. It doesn't actually affect the fighting at the front. It just uh, it affects the ability of the, the, the society and the economy to function, which is not a trivial thing, uh, but, but they'll carry on. Uh, and there's no suggestion from any Ukrainians that this is leading to a, a clamor to, to end it. They just think they're stuck with the war. Mm. Um, they have no choice now but to carry on. Winter is setting in, mm. uh, and that appears to have slowed down the counteroffensive a bit. How crucial is it that something give way between now and, let's say, February uh, for either side? Well, I think what Putin's strategy on, on, in the sort of conventional military side um, is, to, is to try to get them to hold a line now, and then more of these mobics, the mobilized um, men can be trained and equipped and so on for March, say. And I think if, if, the, if the front line does hold in that way, then the pressure on Ukraine to look for some way out will grow because it's, you know, it's an expensive business to keep them going. And uh, I think the offensives, the counteroffensives in September provided a real boost not only to their morale, but made the international community more comfortable with, with what it was doing on their behalf. So I think they do need military success. Uh, I think they'll probably get it. I mean, the basic problem for the Russians is they have ruined their army. Uh, I mean, they've gone through years of military production. Um, uh, their officer corps has been uh, pulverized. Uh, it's the number of senior officers, commanders have been killed as well. Um, I mean, the stories of, of low morale and so on are legion. And the basic problem with winter is you've got to keep warm. Um, and, um, you know, the Ukrainians are beneficiaries of a, of a very large NATO effort at the moment to get winter kit to them. Um, I'd be amazed if the Russians, uh, the Russians, the reports in February, March, which were still winterish, were that an awful lot of the winter kit 
when you know wasn't there when they went to the storehouses um, because as with so much of the Russian military equipment it had been uh, uh, it had been uh, taken and sold um, so we'll see but but you know if you mobilize large numbers of people we know from those already mobilized they've been having to buy their own uh, body armor boots and so on uh, well they're not going to survive in the winter so what's already poor morale will will decline and that can have all sorts of consequences so by and large without trying to be too predictive i would assume that the ukrainians will uh see more gains um it's hard to see how they the russians can hold on to kherson all the way through their the big russian offensive which is very little to do with the actual war more to do with internal Kremlin politics, I think, at Bakhut is just seen countless uh, Russians killed, including those prisoners that were, you, you saw those videos uh, being um, recruited. And in Luhansk, it's slow going because of the weather, but you know, when, the, when things freeze over, there could be more maneuver again. So I would assume that something will give, but if it doesn't, then I think you, you will, attitudes to the war would look quite different in, in the spring. Mm, there'd be more pressure on more pressure, Zelensky. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to ask you about <clears throat> what you think you know, is the most likely outcome for this war. You, you, you talk about possibilities rather than mm. predictions. But I do wonder, going back to the lecture, um, whether the inhumanity in some sense makes a negotiated end to this war less likely, I mean, if that's not a byproduct of, of yeah. the strategy. Well, if you heard Zelensky the other day, uh, say, you know, talking about, the, you know, since they asked for diplomacy while 56 missiles are on their way uh, to our territory, what sort of planet are they on? Um, you know, Zelensky has promised that any deal goes to a referendum. Um, you know, and, and there's lots of polling of Ukrainian opin opinion, and it's pretty uniform. Um, so it's very hard. And it's a zero-sum game, this one. I mean, it's about territory. I mean, people talk of this about NATO enlargement and neutrality, and so on. that's part of it. And you can, I mean, wouldn't dismiss it completely as a factor, but, but it's basically about the existence of Ukraine uh, as a, an independent country. And um, so I think the problem that you have, and people talk about, you know, are the Ukrainians willing to negotiate? Will they compromise? We've seen no evidence of it from the Russian side. There's not a hint of compromise from Putin. And I think that's not because he's confident in victory anymore. He just can't actually cope with losing. Mm. Um, I think, or I think it's easier for Putin to contemplate Ukraine pushing Russian forces out because he can blame NATO than it is for him to say, we withdraw, um, because that will be seen as him admitting failure. And as soon as the war ends, there's a reckoning. Um, people are going to say, well, what was all that about? Well, why have we been through this? Why have we lost? I mean, the Ukrainians say 70,000 Russian soldiers have been killed. It's probably an exaggeration, but not by, necessarily by much. And if it's 40,000, it's still an awful lot of people. Um, uh, so I think it, you know, it would be, the more I, I've, I've looked as hard as I can <coughs> to find how you negotiate a way out of this, and I just don't see it at the moment. At some point, something will happen. But when, you know, you see these claims, all wars end by negotiations, they don't really, all wars don't end by negotiations. They often end with a victory. They sometimes end with a ceasefire, and I think that's possible. But a proper peace settlement is much harder. Mm. Look, I've got three more questions, and then we'll go to, to the audience. And, and the three actually a little bit beyond Ukraine. I might ask you to think about China here. I mean, this is a <coughs> question uh, and an issue that's been the forefront of our mind, <coughs> um, which is to what extent can we view China as an interchangeable threat or risk um, with Russia. There's been a lot of talk about uh, the effects that the Ukraine war has had, <coughs> either to incentivize or disincentivize a, a move on Taiwan, uh, Taiwan contingency. And I wonder wh whether you, you, I mean, part of the 
part of the answer is surely whether you think the Ukraine war is the new norm in warfare or, or an aberration, <coughs> an, an exception that proves the rule. Yeah, I, think, I think all wars are different. And, um, you know, there's always, I'm sure we're, we're all going to get involved in this. You know, what are the lessons of, the, you know, the, you know, when I remember, <coughs> I spent, spent seven years of my life on the lessons of the Iraq war. I said on day one, you know, the basic lesson is don't do it again. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, I don't think this is a pattern. It's a pattern of Russian warfare, as I tried to show. But even as a pattern of Russian warfare, it far exceeds anything they, they've attempted or done uh, since, since 1945. So um, uh, I think we have, to be, we have to be careful about saying there's a new pattern here. People will, you know, look at it for tank, you know, the future of tanks and what it tells us about cyber and drones and so on. There will be things coming out of it. For China, I mean, I think, you know, having spent the last year trying to read Putin's mind, we're going to have to spend the next year having to read Z's. Uh, and uh, both have created systems in which they are at the pinnacle um, and surrounded by sycophants, uh, which are very dangerous political systems. Uh, you know, for all, you know, we all know the multiple faults of our democracies, but at least you, uh, as Britain has rather dramatically demonstrated, if you find yourself with a duff leader, you can change them. Uh, whereas uh, the Russians and the Chinese are stuck with theirs. Uh, so, um, so you know, we are on to this sort of thing where you're not talking about what does China, you're talking about what does he do, what does he think. Um, I think as far as Ukraine is concerned, Z is pretty cross with Putin. Um, he doesn't like to be associated with failure. Uh, and uh, he hasn't done that anything particularly for Putin. Uh, he came, Schultz got him to say he doesn't think nuclear war is a good idea, which is sort of progress of a sort. Um, and, um, you know, you've seen that the weapons he's buying from Russia haven't worked very well, whereas American weapons seem to have worked pretty well indeed. So there's things for him to think about. And to my mind, it's a pretty impressive reminder uh, about not expecting too much from war. It, 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 always, it always disappoints <laughs> as, as a means of solving problems. Uh, so you hope that's something that get, comes through. But he was very clear in the 20th Party Congress not to renounce the use of force on Taiwan. And he couldn't really. I mean, I think what Z wants to do is to remind the Taiwanese that they dare not change the legal status. Uh, I think I'm presuming that's the main objective. I can imagine scenarios in which uh, escalation takes place. I mean, I think it's more likely than uh, a full-scale invasion, which is actually quite a difficult thing to do over those distances, would be a blockade. Uh, if it's a blockade, the pressure on the US and other countries, Australia, even the UK, to break the blockade will be great. And one thing leads to another. So. Uh, uh, I don't think, I think they're potentially quite dangerous situations still. Um, but you would hope that uh, there's a warning here uh, to Z as, uh, as well. I certainly don't see it as a, as a reason why I should feel encouraged to have a go at Taiwan. Mm. Um, but I think in the end, you know, you're looking at the man, his political project, you know, oddly, he and Putin are about the same age. There's obviously something about turning 70, which you have to watch out for. Um, so, I'm 73. <laughs> well, you just passed it, don't you? Um, the, Out of danger now. <laughs> look, uh, final question for you. I mean, we, we could talk about tumultuousness in British politics. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to embarrass you. No, that's all right. I won't, I won't go there, uh, other than perhaps it does show both the best and the worst um, aspects of democracy and British democracy in particular, to be able to mm. have such a short-lived premiership, but also to be able to get rid of someone who, who, who posed instability, risks of instability. Now, 
I, my, my final question is on AUKUS. Mm. And I mean, it's it's hard to think that that was only last year that that yeah. was announced with so much that else that's going on in the world. Um, it uh, made a path for Australia to acquire eventually a fleet of nuclear-powered submarines. So let me ask you, from your perspective, what do you think of the merits of the initiative or on the decision rather than the initiative because it hasn't really materialized yet? And, and once in operation, or if in operation, how much do you think um, that fleet of nuclear-powered submarines would really alter the region's balance of power? I mean, nuclear-powered submarines are a pretty effective system. Um, you know, the, the UK, as you want one in anger once, um, sank the Belgrano uh, in, in the Falklands campaign, and that sent the Argentine fleet back to port. It didn't venture out again. Um, uh, these are effective weapons. Now, I mean, the interesting thing about AUKUS is it's a sort of a mingling of a, of a sort of a massive procurement project with all the problems massive procurement projects have with a sort of geopolitical project. Um, and... Uh, and in a sense, one puts at risk the other. I think that, that that's a sense of the challenge for AUKUS. Uh, if, I mean, there's a technology sharing arrangement which could be expanded beyond nuclear submarines, I think it has potential. It makes sense. I mean, the UK, US, and uh, Australia are very natural allies, easy with each other, trust each other, at least for the moment, and, and so on. Um, the. Um, but it's a heck of an undertaking, uh, and you know, especially for a country that doesn't have a history of building this sort of submarine. Uh, and you know, what you import, how you put it together, are, are big decisions that are in the process of being decided. Now, as far as I understand, nobody's panicking about the situation. The design work is going ahead, and so on. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I, I think I tend to treat it, I think in the end it's the procurement side of it that's going to matter most because there were ways of these three countries talking to each other and doing things together without having to establish something new. So I don't see it as a new alliance. I mean, you know, we're already allies. Um, but, but it's, um, uh, but it, you know, it's, it's important that it succeeds in some way, I think, uh, partly because it's very embarrassing for your government if it ends up with no submarines at all, having, you know, uh, annoyed the annoyed the French, uh, uh, which you know, there's some compensation. But I mean, if if that's all you end up doing, it's not really what the object of the exercise is. Uh, so uh, I think it's important that it succeeds, but it's difficult, and, it, and, and it's you know, with the best will in the world, it's difficult. Mm. Right. Look, we've got a few minutes, but I want to do a lightning round of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we might have several uh, go at a, at a time, and then, um, Laurie, you can sort of pick and choose how you want to uh, approach them. There's a hand at the back. There's a hand at the front. Uh, make Andrea work. We'll begin <laughs> at the back. Thanks. Hi, it's Lawrence. Uh, I, I actually just came back this week from spending most of the year in the, in the region. Um, uh, uh, I, I lastly came from Moldova. But I've been struck throughout the year um, how uh, the Russians are fighting this war. Um, and it's very much, as, as you indicated, that, that they're sort of fighting using slightly 1945 tactics in a 21st century war. And it's, it's, um, um, it, it sort of begs the question of just how long the home front will last. Um, it's a different demography in Russia now. They, they're not having families of, of five or six children. They're, they've got a declining demography. And when people lose a child, mm. it, it has a very particular effect on the social fabric. And I wonder if you observe and consider uh, that as part of your consideration of the war as well. Mm. We'll go straight to the next question. I think there's one of the gentlemen at the front. Um, So, uh, so, <clears throat> so you talked about the Russian apartment bombings in the 90s. So can you talk about uh, what evidence we have that points to Putin being the mastermind behind it? Putin being the mastermind? Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, yeah, so we're going to go to the gentleman to the far left there. Sorry, I'm just and that's by who stuck their hand up first. Uh, yeah, if you can just identify yourself as well. Hi, my name is Victor. Uh, always here, you're talking about. All right, well, we'll go to those two. So, I mean, was that was why, why the West hasn't escalated? Yes. Okay. And, and um, why shouldn't it? Well, I think it was the premise. Yeah. And um, sorry, we're just going to leave it to those three for now. And, and uh, I'll be, I'll try there and will be, be opportunities to speak with, with Laurie afterwards. Um, but we do have to wrap up soon. So, over well, I mean, um, well, the final question, I mean, nuclear weapons, uh, is one reason why the West doesn't escalate. I mean, the West has escalated incrementally in terms of the weapons it's prepared to give Ukraine. Um, I mean, you think, you know, you've got to think back to February when, when the, the Ukrainian population was filling Molotov cocktails uh, to the now using the most advanced uh, American artillery. So, you know, there's, there's been some change, but there's some limits yet. So the next escalation would be aircraft or more modern tanks and so on. So that to look for. Um, I think the home front question is a really interesting one. Um, the treatment of the mobilized men is appalling. Um, and there are stories going back now. Uh, and I don't think the, the I mean, it, it's difficult when you're following a war unreliant on social media because we know that stuff can be manipulated and inserted and so on. But there's enough corroboration, I think, that you, know, you have incidents of a few hundred being dumped, uh, essentially, uh, in Luhansk, um, close to the front line. As soon as the fighting starts, the people notionally in command run away. Uh, they're left with rubbish equipment. Uh, and they get killed, uh, ten per, you know, with only 10% surviving or something. I and mean, there's enough of those sort of stories. Now, you know, they don't always come from Moscow or St. Petersburg. So what sort of political impact it has? Um, so we, when the mobilization took place, you saw, you know, strong protest in Dagestan where um, uh, troops from Dagestan had already had suffered disproportionate casualties. You know, BBC did a, an analysis um, of where the Russian casualties were coming from. Um, and, and, you know, as the outlying regions uh, far outweighed m those from Moscow and St. Petersburg and, and so on. So, um, I think, and that's one reason why Putin did also didn't want to mobilize, because of that concern. So, we don't know, I think, and I, I don't think Putin knows either. Um, we do know that an awful lot of Russians fled, uh, went to Kazakhstan and, and so on, rather than get mobilized. And that itself adds to the dysfunction of Russian society. It's affected their education system, it's affected a lot of their industries. Um, so it will have an effect. I think, you know, the, this, the censorship at the moment, um, there's martial law in some regions, uh, there's a strong patriotic drive. But even if you watch the sort of dreadful Russian state media, you know, you can see the questions being asked. Um, and those questions will become more incessant, I think, if, um, uh, if, if in the end, there's nothing to show for it. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't know the answer, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an important issue. Um, and I wish we did know more about what was going on there. Um, this is Putin's war. It wouldn't have happened without him. Um, a lot of Russians were taken by surprise in the elite. Um, how much he's... I think the way it's been put is, um, you know, people sort of always sort of, you know, Hitler and doomsday uh, sort of thing in the, in the bunker and so on, uh, pouring over maps and moving imaginary troops. Um, I think what Putin has done, and uh, in the sense the mess he's made of Russian military strategy, is to is to be uh, against retreats. 
um, I mean, sometimes you just need to move out because your troops are going to be better somewhere else uh, uh, rather than hold on to a hopeless position. So it's not quite Stalingrad. Um, it's not Stalingrad scale, but, but it's the same sort of issue is um, uh, they fixated on a number of cities and poured immense effort into cities that aren't particularly important in the great scheme of things because that's where they were. And, and the Kherson is, is, is now an example of that. Um, it's very difficult to, at the moment to know exactly what's going on because uh, the internet's down there, there's uh, a lot of cens censorship, um, there's lots of stories of looted material being taken out. I mean, the loot is another part of the whole story here. Um, so Putin is responsible. Um, he, uh, there's the tradition in Russia is of civilian control of the military. Uh, I don't, you know, which is why I don't completely expect a military coup. I, I think the military could say, we can't do this anymore. Um, but that's not the same, uh, 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 which is to some extent they did uh, with Chechnya in '94. Uh, but I don't think they're, you know, they'll, they'll take orders. Um, so it's, it's it's up to Putin, uh, uh, and uh, while while he's still in power, and um, uh, and you know, you're, you're you're left wondering how much he, he actually knows or appreciate what's going on. You know, he doesn't surf the internet. He, he's not on Twitter. Um, uh, maybe Elon Musk will invite him in. Um, he's, um, uh, and there's, a, you know, things he says suggest that he's not a lot of things desperately well informed. So, you know, we don't know. It is a problem of autocratic societies. The, 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 uh, it's not just a question of, you know, orders being imposed from, from the top down. Information doesn't flow upwards uh, because people are too scared to give bad news. Laurie, thank you for, for a fascinating lecture and, and a stimulating uh, conversation. Thank you.